May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We Christians often have mixed feelings about the Trinity, that sometimes we're in love with the Trinity and sometimes it just sort of throws us off. It can be beautiful. It can be a beautiful creation that comes to us, this three in one and one in three spirit. We sing holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed Trinity, and when we sing it in full voice, there's nothing like it, majestic and divine. And we watch our pastors baptize babies at the font in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as Jesus told us to do. And then the waters of renewal and remembrance well up in our eyes and in our hearts as we come together in this Trinitarian faith. And just a few weeks ago, we witnessed two confirmands step forward and confirm their baptism into faith as they said yes and were blessed once again with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We teach from all sorts of ways. At the early service, Reverend Joanna brought an apple and showed the children how an apple is three in one. And you have to think about that. She can teach you separately later. But she showed us that. We also talk about the fire as being three in one, like light and heat and color and the flames all coming together. And when we teach our kids this, they say, yes, and what? <laughs> It's not easy to grasp, right? The Trinity is one of the most repeated teachings of our faith already today. In song and in word, we have used the words many times speaking of our Trinitarian faith. We use it in the creeds as well. And we continually find ways to offer Trinitarian formulas in worship. But still, like the children, some of us say, how can that be? How can God be three in one and one in three? And if any of you have ever been asked by folks outside the Christian faith, maybe even inside the Christian faith, it's a tough one to tangle with sometimes. I believe that as a concept, the Trinity can be confusing. Some have said that it was invented by the early Roman Catholic Church and that it is not mentioned anywhere specifically in the Bible. One of those people was Washington Gladden. And this is what he said about the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a construction of human imagination. Technically, Gladden was right, I suppose. Although the Bible is full of allusions to the three-in-one nature of God. We just heard the creation story that Dana read so beautifully in Genesis. And by the way, I want you to read it again before you leave the space today and take in the days of creation windows one by one and read the story with the windows in mind. But as she read that, we heard wind and word and matter coming together. Jesus spoke often of his relationship to the, as the Son to the Father, and he promised the Holy Spirit and then delivered the Holy Spirit to the disciples in the early days. And when the time came, Jesus gave up his spirit so that the Spirit could take over. He relinquished himself so that the Holy Spirit could step in. But perhaps the greatest mention of our Trinitarian God is the one that I read today from Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. Do you ever wonder as you hear these words about the three-in-one God, is it possible to devote our life to something that we may not completely understand, or more significantly, is it right to commit ourselves to something that we really don't believe in? How do we reconcile the difficult concept of the Trinity with our great commission from Jesus to continue his work of healing, teaching, and bringing the realm of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? Maybe the key to our wondering how the Trinity can be is exactly that. It is wonder. I want you to think about wonder and the Trinity. Instead of trying to figure out how God can be three in one, and we can add to the evidence for the Trinity that is found in Scripture, combining all of our experience and knowledge, I just want you to hold the thought of wonder, which I'll return to in a second. 
I was in Florida the past three days. Not this one, but the three before. I was there to celebrate my grandson Ethan's kindergarten graduation from his Christian Academy Grace Fellowship. The graduation was lovely, and he was well celebrated by his school and family. He was chosen most likely to be a professor, which I don't know how you can actually figure out when someone's in kindergarten, but that's the award he got. Anyway, the family from Florida was there, and I was there to represent the rest of the family. Susan had to stay back and work. So I had, turns out, all the grandchildren all to myself, which was kind of fun. There in the panhandle of Florida, I was aware of a much different environment than where I usually spend my time here in central Ohio. Sultry, swampy, filled with gators, and to top it off, the home of America's leading book-banning governor. As I was praying and reflecting on the threes, and with Trinity Sunday coming up, I was made aware of one of the governor's top banned books, and Tango Makes Three. Does anyone know the book? It's actually been out quite a long time, 18 years now, and most of the years that Tango has been out, it's been on someone's banned book list. And Tango Makes Three is based on a true story, a story about two penguins in the Central Park Zoo in New York City, Roy and Silo. They were two real male chin-strap penguins who fell in love. They did everything together. They swam together. They sang together. They built a nest together and even sat on a rock imagining it to be an egg. Well, the zookeeper noticed this and brought Roy and Silo an extra egg from one of the females who could not care for it. So he brought it to them and they sat on it and they hatched the egg. And when the egg hatches, the zookeeper names the little female penguin Tango. People came from everywhere to the zoo, not just New York City, from everywhere, and cheered the family of three, Roy, Silo, and Tango. Tango grew up very happy and healthy with her two dads. In God's creative order, including the homo sapien part of God's created order, families come in many diverse configurations. And if that's a surprise to you, I don't know what rock you've been living under. And this is where the Trinity and book banning come together. For the last 10 years, Tango has been mocked and challenged by those who are threatened by God's creative order and a different kind of Trinity, true though it is. It reminds me of an article I came across from years ago when the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church in its journal, The Concordian, published an article saying that the Congregationalists were destroying the formulaic understanding of the Trinity. Well, thanks be to God for our forebears who destroyed the formulaic understanding of the Trinity. Wow, what a, what a word. Because of our forebears, the article proclaimed, Christianity would be destroyed by those who would rather speak of experience of faith rather than the creeds of faith even though nowhere in the scripture does the triune God as Father, Son, or Spirit ever write or recite a creed. I'm just saying. I have been told I see patterns and connections that others don't see, and this may be one of those examples. Here's what I see on this Trinity Sunday. I see that love in God and in humanity is always relational and not creedal. I don't know if the walls will shake, and love happens in the Trinity and cannot be named and claimed as exclusive for certain people and their limited and limiting ways of defining love. What they see and say about the Holy Trinity, or penguins for that matter, in love is only allowed with their exclusive interpretation. And that's scary, folks. Wonder and awe as I said earlier, or in the biblical phrase, fear of the Lord is a good place to start because it speaks directly to our relationship with God. It's a healthy reminder that the Trinity is not some mathematical engineering formula. It is all about relationship. Our wonder-filled experiences of the three persons of God mesh. They come out of and lead into scripture and to life. Our wonder and awe of faith takes us directly to the cross, to the font, to the table, and then out into the world. 
We enter to worship in wonder, and we depart to serve in awe. It is wonder and awe that leads us into the relationship we have in worship with one another and together as the body of Christ. Now, all of these parts of the elements make us the community that we are. However, only if we're paying attention to the texture of God in the Trinity that infuses our daily life will we understand it. So stop, look, and listen, and you will see that awe and wonder is everywhere at work. Let's try it out. Take your wonder about God, the Father, the Mother, the Parent, the Creator. Consider Genesis and the stories of creation. Are you able to let these stories touch you in your heart? Stop, look, and listen. Be still. Do you see our Creator God touching the earth, grabbing hold of life and forming it out of the void to protect the earth and be given the power by God to look after everything as we're given in Scripture? Do you see our part in this? Do you see it at all? God's creation is magnificent and masterful. Just as the Rocky Mountains are wreathed in white snow or a sunset on a Florida beach touches us with its multicolors across the sand and water, God is at work in all of this. And we'll, we will see God's presence in all of this if we're aware of awe at all. So do we give in to it or do we not? In Jesus, there is also wonder and awe. In him, we encounter the tougher and harsher realities of our relationship with God as we meet God with skin on in Jesus Christ. I have spent my life looking out at God with skin on and I'm doing it once again today. You are the embodiment of God with skin on. I know that's scary sometimes. You think, this is it? But I've spent my life looking at you. And Jesus is not simply some historic character that's out there, some first century peasant in Palestine. He is that, but he's much more than that. He is all of you working together in the presence of love, coming out of a carpenter's workshop, creating and crafting beauty, but more important, giving care to the world. In the story of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, touch and transformation come together in forgiven places and then leave behind all of the brokenness and find a new way. In the mix of the Holy Trinity, I would say it is the name and the presence of Jesus that changes the world. Muhammad studied Jesus and at the end of his study of Jesus declared him to be the greatest prophet ever to be on the face of the earth. Mahatma Gandhi took Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and as a practicing Hindu used the lessons of Jesus to form his principles of nonviolence and peace that overturned an empire through the power of peace. See, he's the redeeming one because he saves the whole world. He's actually looking after all the world, all the time. Though all the world may not claim him as savior, he is there for the whole world. And then we get the spirit that completes the Trinity. Well, like tango, if you will. <laughs> the spirit blows through a room where hearts are on fire and the spirit destroys all the things that cause for cause death and destruction, wipes that away, and comes to protect and embrace us. The Spirit is one to say thank you for. The Spirit is real, and it is not just simply some amorphous being. It is in you and through you. It holds you together. It's like the mortar in the stone. The Spirit holds us and holds us together. We just need to be open to the Spirit, and the Spirit will lift us and carry us all the days of our lives. So there it is, three and one, and one and three. Once again, the doctrine of the Trinity is not nearly as important as the relationships that touch our lives and that we use to touch others' lives and heal the world in the name of the Trinity. We have a saying in the United Church of Christ, we believe in testimonies of faith and not tests of faith. Those poor Missouri Synod Lutherans who wrote that article so long ago must be rolling in their graves. We believe that it is our lives lived out that matter. Listen and live into the impact of the creator and redeemer and sustainer of God's spirit 
in the three in one and one in three, they offer us law and grace, justice and mercy, compassion and action, all lived in the world through love. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he wasn't, I believe, saying so much that you had to do it a certain way. He was not just interested in making people disciples who would baptize others. He was more interested in getting people out, getting them into places, getting them to relate to others and share his love. Perhaps we are better suited to simply call it love, whatever we do, in the name of the three and one and one and three. I'm more convinced each and every day, that's it, that's all it is. We are just called to strip away judgment and division and hatred and anger. We're in called to embrace love. The three and one becomes one love. And this great commission to be disciples of love, to baptize others with love, to see the creator and redeemer and sustainer in others, is simply to live into awe and wonder and love one another. So let's bring this love to the table today, the table of love. Here, we can tango with God, three in one and one in three. Amen.